I would like to invite Sanford Quinter, Jeff Kipnis, Hernan Diaz Alonso, and Wes Jones, who will be participating in this symposium. Thank you for coming. I think there is no need for uh, presentations. You all uh, know them quite well from yesterday and from your being at SciArc. I'm going to pose them um, three questions. Um, I'm sure that we'll, uh, that maybe I will pose one question and let's see if I get to the next two questions. The topics of discussion today are mainly focused on thesis as an as a overall uh, program at SciArc. Um, the graduate thesis has been reintroduced at SciArc five years ago. This period represented a playground for a young graduate program to learn how to play. This occupation that one could describe as imagining a world in absence of verification has been geared towards individual creativity and imagination uh, based on no pre-existing principles, which shortly after developed ubiquitous techniques and group rituals. As a result, thesis has been able to picture architecture in far more elastic terms. Thesis appears as if it reached a rare tension between individual pleasure and group innovation. Now that SciArc as an institution unquestionably reached a more mature stage, it's important that the thesis program demonstrates its ability to own the choice of what designers need to think about today, fostering a broader culture of ideas and increase in position taking, able to direct the goals of design. So my question to the symposium is, what do designers need to think about today and how does thesis contribute to a broader position taking at SciArc? Are you not going to read all three questions? Yeah. No, I think... Can I hear those questions again? What do designers need to think about today? Okay. As a guest of honor... Robert, Jeff seems to know, really, all the answers with some serious certainty. So, um, it would be interesting to hear what the um, current doctrine is. Um, as you know, I'm um, going to play the role of the generalist today. So, uh, Jeff, are you going to start? Uh, these guys have heard me odd tedium. <laughs> but I, I am going to say something. I mean, I don't let the students talk at all when I'm listening to them. And so forced against my will to listen this morning, I was incredibly impressed and delighted uh, with, I thought, the ardor and passion and uh, interest of the work. I, I think it speaks incredibly well, and I just want to say this publicly to the quality of the advice they've been getting from their prep faculty. So it was quite a, for me, quite a pleasant morning. It's also a good measure of a thesis. If, for me, it's a measure of a thesis is, is I leave with completely new ideas. In other words, the, when students' work is good enough or a student's analysis is good enough for me to give me completely new insights and stuff I've been thinking about myself for a long time, then I think we're on the right track. Now, I, I wanted to relate it to your talk last night. I mean. It's absolutely essential that we re-nourish ourselves with unexpected uh, information from outside the discipline. My balancing to that is always an idea of monadic adequacy, uh, because I believe that part of the question of, I mean, one of the things I thought was interesting last night is you, you look at a species and you point out the fact that the species is a dynamic fluid over time. But in order to be an effective dynamic fluid over time, it actually has to behave as if it's a genus, or it has to be behave generically. They, you know, antelopes like to have sex with antelopes. They run away from prey with other, you know, they, they behave as if they're a thing, even though over time they are not. And so to get that balance in the thesis where you have not just a single topic in which everybody is a, a pursuing as if there were some kind of master discourse, but on the other hand, not so much individuality that there's a kind of irrelevant uh, atomization, much like has happened in the world of music. And so I feel like uh, we're at a very good balance at that right now and, you know, that you can detect the communications. Uh, I mean, for the first time ever, we, we, we're starting to see a thesis project refer to a thesis project from last year. So there, in other words, the students are not only referring to other work, but they're starting to refer to the own work of the school. And, you know, so these are certain minor tactical cues that make me feel like uh, the project is maturing very rapidly and, you know, that we have a sense of what a thesis is. And, you know, so, I, so since I feel like we're on the right track, I'm asking you if 
what, what adjustments we should make. And I think the question Ellen asked is particularly important, and that is what should designers be thinking about today, knowing that the answer can't be something like sustainability or world population. It can't be one thing that turns every designer into a servant. So what I think you taught, what taught us last night is designers have to be thinking about something about how they constantly refresh themselves with new, with uh, new inspirations. But the question is, do they all need to refresh themselves from the same discourse? <clears throat> Let me first say, Jeff, it's going to seriously disappoint you to hear that I agree with absolutely everything you just said. I never am disappointed by that. Now, <laughs> it's not what we anticipated. You and I share do. that opinion. It's not, <laughs> it's not what we anticipated uh, to do today. I would like to add a couple of things to uh, Jeffrey's initial responses to finally listening to the students this morning. And that is that um, it's really unexpected that when students in this day and age present theses that you can actually discern theses. And even though these things were never, they were not, I mean, understandably, they were not completely uh, worked out or completely, let's say, completely nailed down, there is without a doubt a clarity, a focus. Uh, I knew, in fact, what the thesis more or less was in every single case. You can't possibly know what a shock that is because you don't go to thesis. Uh, <coughs> thesis reviews, you guys, yet, anyways, you don't go to thesis reviews around the country. What took me by surprise with Elena's question is that it's the question you asked me. I like to ask. I know, you asked yeah. that to me and you put me on a stage oh, I did. to no answer kidding. that question. And I was like, Jesus, that's such an unfair you know, question oh. to ask. <laughs> but I okay, thought you could address that sleeves. much better. God damn it, Elena, will you get a chair and sit down? You are yeah. making me Hi, nervous. Elena, get over here. <laughs> How predictable of me, actually. Um, I feel that like it is the question that one needs to keep in perspective. Um, what I expected I was going to say today were things like, you know, the minimum requirement of a thesis is no longer that you have a thesis. It's simply that you be interesting. Um, or that, in fact, you claim that whatever it is that you are addressing is important. Now, what is important today? It's hard to break into a kind of a song and dance about that without a kind of context behind one. Um, but I will say that um, having said all these nice things about what was placed on the table before us, things like pedomorphia, uh, uh, symmetry or near symmetry, um, facadism versus uh, non-facadism, etc. Um, I suppose it would be at least an interesting exercise to ask, why is this important? It's certainly interesting. I saw nothing today that I didn't find interesting, certainly. But um, why is it important? Now, to talk about importance, you usually have to take a couple of steps back. And that's where, in fact, I think where the gang splits, you know, where do you take those steps? Um, in a sense, I would, I mean, I mean, let me just say this, I think we should discuss this today, but when Kipnis says it can't be, and then you gave two examples, one was sustainability and the other one was... A radical individual, it can't be something so collective that it dominates uh -huh. everything as a master discourse, nor can it be so... No, I don't think you said that just now, I think you said that last night, pardon me? Yes, okay, good, yeah. Uh, that's how I remembered it. I remember yeah. these were two issues oh, yeah. that were... Yeah. Um, no, population, yeah, poverty, population explosion. Well, yeah, demographic transformation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, let's say that we have found a place where we can disagree. And that is simply this, is it's what Jeff is dismissing, it's not like I don't agree, but you could dismiss some of those things in partial ways or not. It's that I think what Jeff is trying to do is dismiss um, the scope of the type of questions that architecture should ask. And that's where I would disagree, is I think it is the scope. Those are two examples of the scope that architecture should ask, especially in a thesis. But, it's a place. but just to point out, Jeff didn't mention architecture or architects. He said designers. And I think that's pretty key in the difference between these two attitudes. 
frankly. I mean, not to, I mean, you're the man here. Go ahead. No, 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 no. But, Go ahead. Um, I hear what you have to say about that. Because, you know, we play with this distinction all the time at uh, the GSD these days. Since we're a design school, some of us especially find it liberating to think about design, generally speaking. But what were you about to well, say? Well, I was just going to say that it seems to me to, to uh, offer an answer to the initial question that you asked her, that she asked back to you. Uh, is to is to think about the issue from the from the perspective of the uh, projected perspective, let's say, of the architect and the architect's concern, as opposed to the more general concern of the designer, and recognize that that itself is symptom of something that we could uh, uh, have fun thinking of as a crisis in the discipline now, and that the thesis could contribute uh, or or could have something to say at least. Or, or would be seen within the context of that uh, possibility. Why don't you just map it out for us, hypothetically, so we can address it. What's the crisis? What would the crisis have to do? And where do those uh, two terms, um, uh, how do you understand the, the meaning and the differences between those two terms? Um, well, I think actually, uh, while I agree with you, your interest in the generalist, generalism, and certainly architecture and architects have seen themselves as such, within the, the confined context, let's say, of in construction of the environment, uh, I think that we are uh, facing a situation where because of our new, the new tools that are available to us and maybe our in unfamiliarity with them or incomplete familiarity with them now, uh, what formerly had uh, seen itself as relatively uh, autonomous or in control is now getting diffused into the culture in a um, possibly positive but also possibly uh, negative way in the sense of uh, losing its bite, uh, losing the sense of its own particular form of intelligence uh, uh, into, in, now we could argue whether that was a good or a bad thing to the extent that architect want, architecture wants to continue to think of itself as a, as a particular way of considering reality of the world uh, and intervening there, um, I think uh, there is a risk to that. Now, you know, we could argue that maybe it is inappropriate or, uh, or going into the future will be inappropriate for there to be such a balkanization of knowledge that way. Um, but I think that historically at least, this is certainly the way that architects and architecture and the community of architects that has uh, carried forward the, you know, the discipline and the canon and all this has thought of itself. And so to me that constitutes, again, maybe crisis is, is overly dramatic, but I think you can make an argument you know, uh, at one extreme end that we're facing the potential disillusion of the idea of the architectural itself. Now, again, that dissolution could be a good thing. I mean, uh, to, uh, there was a uh, Asimov story a long time ago uh, called uh, Green Eyes, I think, or Green Fuzz, um, that was about, basically the idea was it was a contest between uh, the, the individual possibilities and mentality of the humans and a planet-wide consciousness, more kind of a, uh, a, a, an organism that uh, basically uh, where, where all of the life on a particular planet was uh, simultaneously conscious, sort of a hive mind condition. And so, and it had a very uh, messianic, or let's say a missionary zeal to import its way of uh, consciousness into the rest of the world. And anyway, humans would visit this planet and, and, and the sign of the presence of this was they would get green fuzz for their eyes, which is uh, a sense of a much more connected uh, uh, way of interacting with the world, m many more sensors, this sort of thing, rather than purely vision. You know, there's a, you feel the force. I mean, this is a new term. Anyway, so all interconnected, all, all general, all uh, um, diffused throughout the, uh, the biosphere, as it were, versus, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the idea that we at least have of an individual consciousness and the ability and agency associated with that. But, uh, you know, as uh, you, Sanford, and me have come down the road together pretty much in parallel for a long time. And uh, uh, what's really interesting is I, you and I tend to be become increasingly disciplinarily oriented, although in different, 
different terms and uh, Sanford not. But I, I wanted to pick up the, uh, like I think the swarm intelligence is an interesting thing to introduce. But for example, if you look at a flock, uh, if you look at a uh, flock of birds, you know, or a school of fish, then it, ha it behaves as an intelligent organism as a collectivity precisely because each of the fish is not trying to behave as that organism. You know, so the intelligence comes out of the interconnectivity. It doesn't, now if you take, for me, an ecology is replace each fish by a species and look at the behavior of that single organism at, a, at, a at the next level of complexity. What you want to do is resist the implication, the, the temptation to, to turn that into a monoculture. You know, and what, when you speak of crisis and population problems and sustainability, there's a tremendous urge to make those monocultural, make, to make any response to that driven by monoculture. Whereas I think the ecological model says the most intelligent thing to do is to proliferate um, speciated differences and let the swarm intelligence solve the out. problem. Um, this is where I think Sanford's lecture was so good, despite his misinterpretation of all the facts that he presented us. <clears throat> uh. <laughs> we, um, we learned a lesson from what happened in the 90s. When I say what happened in the 90s, I mean what happened in design, what happened in thought, what happened in society, what happened in economics, and that was that those who allowed themselves to be duped by the idea of laissez-faireism, or rather invisible handism in the design world was, uh, uh, was something that we could do with impunity. It is intellectually cowardly, it is intellectually lazy, but it is also catastrophic from a purely empirical point of view. So most of us basically faced, I mean many of us I suppose, face this idea. So it seems to me surprising that one would think, even be able to put it on the table today as a possible, as a possible um, ethical position or that's to say a possible uh, 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 you know, route of, uh, of, of, of behavior to respond to our world in that way. I think that responding to the world and responding to our historical period is something we basically need to do. Now the thing about that, of course, is that we are weary of some of the cliched and routine ways in which that has been done in our field, in other fields, et cetera, et cetera. I still think, however, it is the great, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's the thing we must do, and it is for us, because there are some particularities about architecture, and I, I really would like to rethink some, or rather discuss some of the ideas that uh, Wes just proposed, because they really, in, I, I agree with him in a way, though he presents them very calmly and very, I agree that these are the problems right now in the design world. These are the conundrums. I don't have the answers for them, uh, but I think that uh, we, have to con we have to confront precisely these conundrums and ask ourselves, what is today the, the boundaries, the scope of architectural thinking? I mean, I don't know exactly what architecture refers to. You didn't come right out and say that it was just to do with buildings. You didn't say no. that because, in fact, I know you have a sense of where else it migrates. Um, architecture today, more than perhaps it's ever been before, it is a kind of an aggregator of knowledge and, uh, and different knowledges. Um, I think to acknowledge this as we go forward, if you like, into the brave new world, um, is to change the way we think about practice, um, the way we think about the world. Uh, I think there's a, lots of questions about the scope of an architectural, how, how one will define the scope of an architectural problem today. I think this is a fantastic place to test these new forms, if you like, of, of, uh, of thinking. That's why, and I also believe that it should be a place where you are protected um, to put together hypotheses that may appear to have very little hope. That's what they used to call, what they call it, high risk, high yield hypotheses. High risk of failing and astounding yield should they succeed. 
thesis should be hypothetical, it should be imaginative, it should be bold, it should be rigorous, and it should ask fundamental questions because you don't, oh, I mean, I don't know, I would I'd almost like to say this to Wes, put him right on the spot now, and I say, the courage, to the degree that you had great courage when you did your thesis, does that not still play out today in the way you formulate questions, even at a symposium like this? Uh, Is there a spirit of Well, no, absolutely. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. I, I think that risks only mean something within a context of the, uh, you know, the potential for the failure. Uh, that potential is defined by, you know, what Jeff is, is, is pointing toward the possibility of a monoculture, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't understand I, that. But. I'm thinking more in, 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 in light, in, in the sense of that old saw, uh, uh, think globally, act uh, locally, uh, that the thesis as an exercise uh, wants to have uh, one hand, so to speak, in, in the larger questions like sus sustainability, let's say, or, or poverty, whatever. Um, and that the consciousness of, of the individual thesis position in relation to that um, and potential rejection of that, let's say, which may constitute courage you know, in the way you're saying it, actually makes it, it seems to me, more interesting, raises the stakes, invests it with more uh, potential um, uh, risk uh, as it surfs this line between, you know, individuality and, and the monoculture phenotype and genotype, you know, from last night uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so I, I don't think that the, the thesis is at all diminished or, I mean, I trust in the natural and the natural diversity of the student population to uh, of avoid uh, uh, a kind of homogeneous, even if we were, say, to declare a theme, it seemed to me that that would be, uh, immediately the student's first uh, reaction would be to contest that, uh, I would like to believe, and to try to distinguish themselves within that larger theme, and I'm not advocating uh, that, but I'm just saying, it seems to me uh, not enough of a concern to base a program on uh, uh, and, and that, in fact, what I, what I would be more concerned about would be the sense that everybody's kind of off doing their own thing without any kind of uh, reconnection to the mothership s such as it is, because it's only by that reconnection that whatever their own thing is gets to actually start to inseminate the mothership with, with other possibilities. Well, <clears throat> a couple of um, sort of random thoughts in relation to what you guys have mentioned is, and we were discussing earlier this morning, I am... For a couple of years, part of the problem that we were trying to pose in relation to thesis was to try to define a sense of relevance, which um, my limited English always, in, in my mind, I always think that relevance and importance are sort of different. They are, they so are. I'm much more interested in the problem of relevance and importance when it comes to thesis and to architecture. And one thing, at least, um, my interest was in relation to thesis, which is public knowledge. I'm, I'm, I hate this is to, uh, to understand as a problem. It was always to define, okay, is relevant to the profession or is relevant to the discipline? With the hope that some, somewhere down the road, those two things come together. And as I mentioned to both of you earlier this morning, I'm coming to the conclusion that I think the idea that the discipline and practice or discipline and profession can come together is gone. I really think that that's don't gonna happen again. I think me and that moment was the last moment that profession and discipline was, it was possible to conciliate them. I think that for me is impossible, at least it's impossible in the near future. And I think that to an extent, it changed the problem substantially in terms of how we approach the problem of thesis. That's one thing. The other thing which, again, based on, you guys were there over dinner last night, it was like a very long discussion between these two guys. And I hate to do this because I always against the idea of it doesn't need to be either or. I mean, it's an expression that I hate. But in this particular case, I really don't think it's one versus the other one. Because I think the general, if, which I don't know is a completely fair description of your position, but let's say the general, uh, general uh, generalist approach to it, of interest, I think it's a useful way to think, to work, to, to think about it. I don't think it's a useful way to work on it. 
So you can have a general approach, and, and, then, and then you have to work with way more expertise, expertise based or specific way how you, how you work and how you isolate part of the thing. Is possible for architecture or any kind of hypothesis or thesis to really have risks? I think we get into a point that, I don't know, it seems like risk is not that interesting or that possible anymore, to understand. I mean, like, I, I don't know. That's it. Nothing seems to be that risky anymore. I mean, what really is risk at risk? So a, again, I, I always think is there is some kind of a self-emulation kind of ambition to that, which I, I don't know. A, again, well, I mean, I, and the last thing, and, and then Wes, uh, as I said, I still quiet. And the other thing, which is, is uh, the last problem I will talk about in relation specifically to thesis, because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to help these people with, is there is a fundamental transformation, let's say, with somebody like Wes did thesis was, was like 20 years ago, something like that? 10 years ago. Shut up. Something like that. <laughs> years ago. No, no, no. Uh, or even when I did it 10, 12 years ago, we had to do with the, 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 no, the notion of knowledge acquirement and knowledge distribution and the speed of knowledge. I mean, the idea that 20 years ago, thesis was basically much more obsessive, slow, deep understanding of that. And today, for whatever reasons that they're known, the transfer of knowledge and so on is much more faster, but also lack of depth. And I think that already is changing the way that we have to approach that problem. So anyway, none of these things are really conclusions. They're more like random thoughts and open questions in relation to these problems. But I think for me, the importance and relevance is, is one of the critical ones to distinguish. Uh, that makes any sense? It does indeed. Um, relevance, well, I mean, maybe we'll, I'll, I'll get to that second. Uh, what occurred to me more uh, pressingly in the last part of your uh, reflections was the opportunity that thesis offers for slowness, uh, especially and most saliently in an environment in which things, if you like, they are. They simply are. They're, uh, they're piecemeal. They're intermittent. They are nested. I mean, we live in an environment where uh, attention itself and the, the modalities of attention, uh, the relationship of work, focus, uh, uh, concentration uh, is something that has been largely removed or at least hugely broken up and atomized, largely removed from the scene, if you like. Intellectual life, and I include in that design meditation and design practice, has undergone extraordinary transformations. Like you say, we don't have to talk necessarily now about those reasons. Um, the type of discipline that I am, I mean, I thought I had one idea simply is to say that this is a special opportunity thesis and uh, that they, it must be disciplined. Uh, Jeff last night came up with a very provocative idea um, at dinner one which indeed I had to think about all night um, uh, because I wasn't totally sure that it belonged to the category of the 99% of things that I disagree with Jeff about. And it turns out it didn't. And he said, genot well, he said very simply, uh, genotype doesn't matter. That's to say the genetic information that is one way or another uh, uh, determinant of, uh, of a form. What really matters only is the form. Let us re cast, if you like, our way of acting in the world as simply being a deployment of forms and understanding the differences between forms and having some kind of, in a way, faith that forms can affect forms and they can do it in a, in a useful way. Um, I think the shooting from the hip um, uh, ethos that that seems to encourage is not really uh, appropriate uh, for thesis. To get back to slowness, it is a moment where there is, one is protected in some ways from the, the temporality of the way, if you like, in which our environment actually forces us to use our nervous system, to go back generally in some ways to, to some of the ideas I was talking about last night. I think it's a time uh, for concepts. I think it's a time for, for reading. <laughs> Jeff's brain's He's lighting up. You part. know, they say that. They do this, you know. They, 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 they stick these things in people's head to see when a neuron lights up, you know. And <laughs> I guess we got a neuron. We got, I guess, you know, two. I guess his brain. Two neurons are going. They used to say that, you know, it doesn't have two brain cells to rub together. It clearly, he now does. <laughs> um, 
And what can I say? You know, this is a school that has prided itself for, in its traditions as well in a, for a, a kind of an exuberance of, uh, of a kind of speculative production. At the same time, the tasks are different today. The mood is different today. I happen to feel that it's a very good wager that if you will go against the tenor of your times, you're standing a great, a much greater uh, chance of, um, of coming up with something important. I agree, you uh, which is why I'm encouraging Do you, invest that you to go against the tenor of, listen, I, I think there's the monoculture thing. What does that mean? Would you, you explain that to me? Yeah. I, when I don't you feel wipe out uh, the diversity of species <laughs> in order to plant one plant for economic reasons, because it's an urgent plant to have, is exactly what you would like to do to the field. Me? Yeah. You would yes. like it to become more responsive to the world. That's your phrase. And that, that means... That hardly, that hardly, that hardly, yeah. Now, so let me point out something. The, the, me, the one thing that a monoculture is allowed to do that preserves diversity is responsivity, interaction. Uh, right. So, I mean, and I think the, the, the interesting question about the, the history of this school is quite interesting as an ecology. There was a period of time when adequacy of the self, not monadic adequacy, but self-adequacy, was the driving, you know, whatever you thought to do was good enough rationale. Then when Neil and uh, Michael took over, they actually tried to make this a school responding to the world, uh, more monoculture-like. It was, I think, an incredibly interesting experiment and an important failure. And failure, in other words, with results we need to pay attention to. So instead of going back to the first version, uh, we, we now take up the possibility of an ecology of possibilities, an ecology of groups that form, that instead of giving them topics, that the topics evolve from them, but make sure that they understand that they are not individuals in the, in the, in the original sense, but they are part of emergent collectivities that are going to be fluid, that they find their communications that way, and that they trust, that that's an, that's, they trust in that adequacy. Now, I want, Wes asked it a really important question, and I think we need to pay attention to it. Uh, you know, he asked about what is, this, what is the status of architecture and its canon, you know. Now, I will point out to, to uh, Sanford that if science, which he likes so much, took his message, every scientist, whether you were a cosmologist or a biologist or a particle physicist, would redirect their attention to the conditions of the world and respond to it. But instead, it produces extremely effective solutions by staying in its speciated differences. But on the other hand, it's atomized. There's no such thing as a scientist anymore. A cosmologist will not have a conversation with an astronomer because they speak such different languages they don't even recognize each other as scientists anymore. Uh, so the degree of, now what's, in architecture I think is important to notice is for economic reasons and simple properties of matter, but see, can it I was so immobile. Let me give me. It was such an immobile discipline for so long that it was not able to actually turn into a fully developed uh, ecology. Now, I, you know, I think it's important that we've noticed it. So it doesn't make any sense anymore to talk about architecture. But I, I think there's a there is an essential difference between science and architecture in this analogy, and that is that science does uh, have an overarching criterion for truth. In in, in yes. In, and so that, that alone can link everybody and free them up to go yeah. off into their own uh, and so the corners. And architecture does too. It's and, just and, and at the end of the day, there, there's also the possibility that finally all science ends up as physics uh, when no. we understand it well enough, or biology, you know, depending on what. M no, because I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, if Whereas you're, in architecture, if you're sitting in this audience last night and you are an uh, atomic physicist, then everything he talked about was a, was, would have been a literary. poor represent, literary representation of what was real science. If you were a... But they would have had the ability to, 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 to talk about that in relation to a common reference and whether that... That's why I think the science model is, being is applied correctly to what we do. I mean, First we, of all, let me say one thing. We should get it off the table because uh, I just want to say this in case it is not clear. At no time would I advocate the scientization of architecture. I want to make that absolutely clear. One of my biggest uh, 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 wake-ups, in fact, in this in the last couple of years was realizing even in the areas 
Well, let me just say that I do not advocate that at all. I simply feel that um, in the void left by, in the void that the lack of production, philosophical production in our, um, um, in our culture, that science has been incredibly productive of concepts and models um, and certain forms of clarity. It's been enormously creative and it's that creativity that I simply feel is interesting to follow. Now that's me personally. I'm interested in anyone's uh, uh, world, you know, anybody who's following anything, whether it's, you know. I, I think it's very interesting this uh, conversation, especially about the idea of models, because I think that we as architects maybe don't know enough about science sometimes to understand that these are simply models of logical organization of knowledge. Coming from a different discipline, being being trained not as an architect, I can tell you that all these are different models of science, mathematics, and it's very clear that it's actually a logical translation, and we admire, I think, the collective effort through the centuries to actually create those models. I don't necessarily think that's the truth in general, and such a thing would ever exist. I think it's a philosophical, uh, it was a philosophical problem yesterday, to me, much more than either an architectural problem or science, or it was an interest in a model of thinking. Yeah. But, but, but I wanted just to move to the next question, which might be um, important, because I think we, we already skipped to the second one, which was b the difference between individual and alliance thesis, meaning we have these two different models in thesis right now, which is a singular thesis of a person that thinks of an individual problem, and people that actually are advancing something larger, you know, and the understanding that something larger is, can be shared. And I think we kind of describe this as an ecology and something fluid that, that is fluid enough. What does that mean, the second one? She skipped it. Meaning, no, 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 no. she was like, you skipping teeth. I'm, I'm skipping oh, teeth. Thesis, yeah. Because Short I think. minute skip of teeth. I'm skipping huh. teeth because it seems like you cover teeth, meaning like you cover what a group <laughs> is and what an individual thesis is. Is meaning. Don't worry about it. But my, my other question, if, if we understand that there is an ecology well, let me of just thesis. just get this right. You're, you're you guys saying that you're experimenting with, uh, with group theses? No. 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 We think no. there are families of theses. I see. We are, yeah, we are going, we're beginning to think about experimenting I have a, with an interesting swarm. theory about the space for you about that. <laughs> with swarm thesis. Like students that sit next to each other, their work tend to look more alike than the students that they, I mean, explain. Good. Yeah. That's, no. that's, that's exactly right. By the way, if you grow up next to somebody, your accent is going to sound more like theirs. I don't know about that. Well, I do. I listen <laughs> to you. I listen to Florencia. Sort of I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not puzzled at all. I did notice. Look, you know, this happened. I mean, you know, I'm not a Californian. I came here. One thing that did I find fascinating, uh, what I did find fascinating today is in the examples that were presented, so many of them were local. Okay, on one level, like, what's the surprise? On another level, it's like, whoa, like, this, is, this is so local. Well, this is my thought. Do Go you, ahead. In what way? Is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, how then, if we understand that there is an ecology of thesis, how can disciplinary tools, or how can we establish a way for which, in which they can describe and understand each thesis as being advancement of that discourse? Meaning, if we establish a culture of ecological thesis and groups of people that are doing and advancing something in this discipline, what are the tools for them to advance altogether, other than still keeping individual thoughts? Is it more of a... Okay, look, you know, I'm, let me just say one thing on this subject is that it would be a tremendous loss of richness if thesis at SciArc ceased to be thesis at SciArc. You know, you get an invitation to go see thesis at SciArc and you're going with a certain expectation which is not the expectation you have when you go and do thesis at Yale or thesis at Princeton because it's thesis at SciArc. Now, whatever constitutes the unity I think we're going to be all right on that subject. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> no, no, I know that. I know that. So I want to say that, you know, I don't know what the monoculture concept is. I've never feared the monoculture, but maybe it's because <laughs> I'm so much, uh, yeah, maybe it's true. Maybe, I, maybe I'm so unaware of the fact that I'm promoting it. I had uh, never occurred to me for a second. Um, that wouldn't happen. But I would like to say that, you know, you don't need to actively discourage the kind of, just to use the metaphors we're playing with today, I don't demand that anyone do this, but the speciation, the fact that here there is a kind of a collective culture. You would not want to squash all of the 
all of the benefits, all of the virtues of I wouldn't say regional, but it's a, kind of, uh, it's a kind of specificity that has to do with the collectivity of the condition uh, inside of which we are. Somebody's phone is firing away as we speak here. Um, that's important. That is simply, that is important. At the same time, there are indeed questions today that, uh, that belong to all of us. And, you know, I saw nothing objectionable in the presentations of theses, but we're discussing thesis in, a, in the generic sense as well as specifically thesis here. And I just think that really thesis is a special opportunity that doesn't come again. And one should think to oneself, what is it that the protected nature of thesis can allow one to do that is not part of the routine uh, um, God, I slept so little last night, I can't, that is part of the routine, um, how about the routine? This stuff, no, yeah, the, the routine, this idea that Sanford did a loss for words is <clears throat> such an incredible moment. No, I tell moment. you, it's terrible, it's I stress and it. thing. Um, it's being recorded. Now, what I want to say very simply that, what is it, just that <laughs> it allows us to make an effort to bring onto the table something which is not part of the routine uh, repertory, let's say, of what uh, would normally be there. I would say that a certain kind of reading, a certain speed of work, um, maybe bringing some things back onto the table that have been off of it for 10, 20, 30, or 40 years to see what they might do. One of which, and I just want to make sure I say this before I leave, is there, I do go into the question of what is important. I think that one way or the other, one should, some of us anyway, some of you, should be uh, thinking about the way in which the traditional architectural problem today is increasingly becoming a problem of experience. Experience really is now a, one of the topos, one of the topics, one of the central philosophical experience, well, I can't say experiential, one of the central questions of what it is that architecture does. The engineering, if you like, of experience and even the production of possible experiences that are simply more or less foreclosed by the current organization of society, economics, um, uh, our, techno our technosphere, uh, our education systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I always believe that thinking against the cliches, let's say, or the routines of one's time is, is a fruitful thing to do. It, it never fails to surprise. But I, I don't think there is, honestly, I don't think there's much of a risk in there. In, because I was thinking when you were giving the lecture last night, the, the first thing I thought in my head was that to me, this, one of the major strengths of architecture as a discipline is, ex, is also that it's a very weak discipline as proprietary of intellectual content. And we're always looking into something else to give us some kind of an armature to relay with it. Sociology in the 60s, art, philosophy, science. And I was thinking, I would, would you imagine in a biology school, an architect and go and give them a lecture about thousand years of evolution of architecture without any effort to relate it specifically to biology? Like, what you did last night it was really basically that. I mean, it's unthinkable, and our discipline operates in that level. So I think that always, for me, that always gonna be present. I don't think there is way that we ever are gonna avoid that. The, the desire to go against the cliche, I think is the cliche of our discipline. I mean, I think it works within that territory, that desire to never be at ease with what it is. So to be that, I would say, I don't think that that is a major issue or, 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 or a, uh, from part of the problem. Now, in relation to the, the specifically the question that Elena is talking, um, there is also, for me, there is a cultural transformation in terms of between the individual and the collective that is very evident, and I think probably music is the one that is more, more obvious. If anybody who follow mainstream hip-hop music and so on, 
is becoming a field with the music producer is more important than the artist. And actually, if you buy any hip hop record, these 12 songs, 11 are collaboration between multiple artists. The, the, the idea of the single artist and so on, again, that's not a new, and I mean, from Arky Grant to, I mean, it happens many times in history, but I think it's changing the culture. And I mean, I'm 42, so I'm still considered a young guy. And when we look behind us, let's say the early 30 guys and so on, they're all going into more like a consulting, collaborative, producer model. And I think that, for me, is a radical transformation slowly that is happening in the field. That I don't think thesis still has becoming very accountable for but that. See, to me, that's, that is maybe a symptom of this crisis that I'm, as an old guy, uh, noticing. Um, uh, maybe but why a you way call, that but, but the question is why you call that a crisis? I, I mean, I, I don't know yet if that is a crisis or well, it's just. Yeah, no, and certainly I think it's worth debating whether it is something to be looked forward to or dreaded. Yeah. Um, let me just put it in in a different context. It seems to me that a lot of what we valorize today in architecture, and I don't think that these theses were particular examples of that, are issues of uh, technique and stuff that. Uh, in, in, in 20 years or 30 years, we will recognize as merely vocational concerns. Uh, if we are heading toward a convergence of uh, applications and platforms and software and everything, uh, and an increasing transparency of them, uh, uh, of them to our intentions, uh, then it seems to me we're going to find ourselves um, potentially uh, 30 years from now when your mom can design a house with gestures and, and natural language uh, and because of the expert but systems and everything else I don't else know, Wes, because you can buy a guitar, what a is guitar going and a wah wah pedal and you're not going to be Jimi Hendrix. No, anyways. no, well, that's my point. It's a, precisely that, is when all of the skills that we associate with architecture now, which are, again, various digital platforms and such, have become commonplace, and when the structural gymnastics that we are so impressed by become trivial through... Uh, you know, nanotechnology, let's say, uh, what could be left is the residue of the architectural, the yeah. sense of judgment that tells us a good <coughs> one from a bad one, and that's what I feel could potentially be lost if the discipline, which is, again, a, has, has connotations that are certainly negative these days, haven't always been that way, gets diffused into the culture generally, and we, we lose that that particular s form, way of looking at things that we call the architectural now. Now, again, we could argue about that. whether no, that's no, I good or bad that. or uh, whatever. I'm, no, no, I agree with me you. Me, selfishly, that. I think it's not good because <clears throat> I've invested my life in assuming that there was importance in that and value there. But, uh, no, but Wes, it's not important. It's the fact that you can do tricks that no one who doesn't know that stuff can't do. Like, if I ask you the effect of a staircase going down or going up, if I want to make something more important, you know, you know, it's not that the stuff is important, it's that you know it like a magician and you can do virtuosic tricks with it that virtually no one else that has bought the instrument, the guitar and stuff can do. So your mom will be able to design a staircase and all that sort of stuff, I mean, do design houses, and she'll get the kitchen closer and closer to the garage. She'll never understand how powerful an idea it is to have this kitchen sink facing away from the window in the mesa. That's exactly what I'm talking about, though. But you're, in other words, magicians are, everyone can do magic. There's amateur magic to professional magic, but it's the, it's the effect of the trick that matters. It's not the status of the knowledge. And I, one thing I think you can be guaranteed is because there's a hysterical obsession in a small population with the triviality of architectural tricks, and has been for a long time. No, but I'm not talking about. The, that I the, guess that the that the technology of convergent, uh, I mean, the convergent technology is not going to do anything about that. No, I, but I guess I'm not trying to say that the value is in. Uh, uh, is in the fact that you know it and the other people don't. I, my, what I'm saying is the value is in the thing that you know that you know, not that you know it, but I what know, it is. But you're teaching, we're teaching magic tricks. No, but, but I think, that, let's say for example, a, a magician would uh, uh, be able to say what's a good one and a bad one, a well-performed one versus a less well-performed mm -hmm. one. 
uh, and magicians would talk amongst themselves in such a way. You know, we used to talk about sitting around the table in Peter's office and just kind of making sound effects and pointing and stuff and everybody mm -hmm. being able to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't so much about the obscurity of the knowledge as it was the particular character of it and the fact that it was uh, shared. Uh, and, and that I guess it was, and in that it was valued because there were certain people who saw that the, uh, the quality of the effects that were achieved um, were potentially repeatable or uh, open-ended in terms of where other things that, that they could lead to, that they had a certain relationship to the world that was better than, than another. Um, so yeah, but again, I think but that's where I disagree with you is really simple, and it's based on Sanford's lecture. Uh, two pieces, two, before he leaves, the two comments I want to make about the lecture. For me, it was not, wow, ecology is interesting. For me, it was, look, look how much passion he has about it. You know, and that that hysterical exaggeration of what is a fairly generic argument is exactly the message for me. Not everybody should learn ecology. It's everybody should find their community of exaggerated passions. Now, there was a time when architecture was so immobile for financial reasons, for material reasons, for design technology reasons, that it was a very small and fairly fragile and not very robust ecology. We ne so. That's the time you're nostalgic about. Um, it's like when the, the, when the only six people on Earth that knew anything about geometry were the Pythagoreans. So they, did, they nodded. And they would kill the one person who exposed the, the uh, irrationality of the That's diagonal. Mathematics turned into a fully blossomed ecology of many, 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 many species. It didn't go away. And architecture is undergoing the process but of see, that there's a, there's a essential difference there between the quantifiable examples that you're operating with and the, you know, for lack of a better word, poetic, and I, I don't really want to be saying that, but the, literally these ineffable dimensions that architecture, this thread that is carried along uh, that allows us, however anachronistically, to talk about a Greek yeah, temple. But but uh, I think Wes, I don't think they're going to go away. I think you just need to add variables, well, that's like the, any other that's field. That's the like, question. Like I mean, if, if you think uh, again, I always use music because it's the most useful example. I mean, if you look at the '60s, there were like 20, 30 relevant guys in the popular music field that they were already 20 times more than let's say in Mozart times, no. and right now they are in the thousands, and there still there's none. great music and bad music, and then. You just need to have a much well, but more I, sophisticated no. palette. But I have to tell you, I yes, think sir. music is a perfect example of when a discipline is so successful that it becomes completely irrelevant. So what's happened in the complete efflorescence of music into a, a robust, it's no longer an ecology, it's a jungle. It's like the, uh, it's like the, uh, like the Amazon. It has so many species that are sp so specific that it is incredibly democratic, or even more than democratic, but it has absolutely no cultural relevance anymore. People don't find music politically significant to discuss. I agree it, with that. I just want to say one thing before I leave because it's a bit of an, I would love to address the comments you just, you made earlier, but I would just like to say uh, a view from the East Coast, I believe it's still a fairly East Coast idea. I did want to, place it on the table for those who are interested, who are doing thesis now, but also for doing thesis in the future. Uh, one of the things that it looks like uh, truly a strong trend is interest in, uh, in something called spatial practice. Uh, now that is of course a considerable, that represents a considerable generalization of a lot of the processes that used to be collected under the term architecture, but I don't think you would reject most of these things, these areas of spatial practice, but they often put... a fairly n uh, recent addition to the... Uh, well, that's it. Well, I was going to say this. If I had more time, I was going to say exactly. last night, some of you may remember, Jeff was uh, extremely shocked that I used the word space um, last night um, in, my, in my talk. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of reasons one could discuss for why that was done. It was certainly done with deliberateness. Um, I do want to add that uh, spatial practices uh, is often uh, prefaced with the term experimental, very often called experimental spatial practices. Now that has uh, offered uh, a great, um, it has allowed a lot of the passions, a lot of the interests, and especially a lot of the idiosyncrasies that are swirling around today, especially in the culture and the cultural acquisition, the cultural environment 
you know, of the young. It is allowing uh, for the expression of some great idiosyncratic positions. When you use that term in relation to me of a, what was it, a hysterical uh, or, or, or hypertrophic position? No, no, I think all no, of us. But no, but also, but I mean, yes, I know. But what Jeff, the, in the context of uh, uh, Kipnis's ideas, his argument is that culture is essentially driven by these hypertrophic. Uh, um, yeah, hysterical exaggerations. Well, you call them hysterical exaggerations. Really, what they are is what I referred to yesterday as umwelt. Umwelt. Okay. They, well, you call, they are. They're passional. They're, as Deleuze and Guattari would say, they are passional. But what they do is they constitute a unique world. Um, and they are what situates an organism actually in the world is the specific world that the organism in certain ways projects and anchors. That is what makes things interesting. That's what life essentially is all about. And that is what drives history. I absolutely agree. So when we understand that, we have to understand that experimental spatial practices is the way, if you like, in which, you know, in which, I mean, if I can say it this way, you guys all understand what I'm saying. It's the psyarchization, essentially, of the entire field. It is, I mean, you know, there was a time when experimental work at the AA in England, you know, in a couple of places in California was actually happening. Um, but spatial practices, it also involves, you figure it out for yourself, it also involves uh, letting go of some of the pieties of what so constitutes. Spatial Olympics. <laughs> spatial Olympics. He's so close to what Spatial Olympics. Oh, special. <laughs> you guys understood. I mean, this is spatial. I yeah, know, I know. In my head, it's, it's, your it's, your like there. it's very spatial. <laughs> Actually, that's what architecture is, is spatial Olympics. Something that always did fascinate me was how many architects, even uh, ones who grew up in an Anglo-Saxon country and culture, still put the word C in the word spatial. Yeah. I noticed that today, even on a lot of the slides, not just for that word, but where places where a T ought to appear, the C goes in. That's, uh, that you could say is, a, is an architect's Failure to use a spell? No, it's, their, yeah, it's a special, it's the mutant gene that, become, that brings you to a school like this. Just to wrap up the conversation today, I would like to ask one, one bit from everybody. So clearly we had a preoccupation with applying computational tools to architecture for the past 15 years. This has been consuming and implementing and enriching our practice in many different ways. There are downsides and upsides in what happened, some intellectual naivete but also we expand our discipline. We had a collective thesis. Is it still time for a collective thesis? And if this is the case, how is it possible for disciplinary tools to become generators of ideas? What's a collective thesis? I think what we have done. Group thesis, more than one person. Yeah. Oh, I see. Are you, well, are you talking about specifically a, a, a group, or are you talking about a whole class working on the same idea like sustainability. No, I'm talking about the fact that we are discussing the fact that tools have been uh, quite Rock dominant uh, and they've been partially a preoccupation. And if that is finished or if that is specialized enough. Well, it's just become normalized. Or it's normalized. Um, well, let's see if it's normalized uh, or if it just evolves. Basically, is it possible for disciplinary tools, like what we use to design, the magic tricks to actually formulate or generate ideas, basically, is this tricks and ideas are linked to each other, and if yes, how? Anyone can go first? Yes. Sure. Um, I will be brief on that. I will say my personal view is that era that the tools and the computer whatever be enough to be this is a hypothesis for me it's over i think the most interesting part about today is a design idea design concept is at that front in relation to that that's being said it's going to have to keep moving that relation my point is we all came to the school today driving cars we didn't ride horses you know there was a moment that there was a discussion about that it's not a discussion it's part of the general life you know that doesn't stop the discussion about the evolution of car design so it's not going to go away but i think right now the idea uh, and I still uh, one thing i feel very the, one of the few things i feel pleased about this is is you don't hear those things anymore pretty much the thesis that is based on some computational trick or script you know what we were discussing about patrick this idea that 
a technological apparatus became like a religious command commitment that it takes care of everything, for me that idea is gone. And I think it was gone a long time ago. I think it was yeah. gone already 10 years ago. And we did, without noticing, I think we move into a different territory, which is, again, it's like sort of one perspective come on board, and then it, nobody discussed anymore. It became, again, about an architecture problem. And to me, that's where we are, and hopefully for a while. And, but that's been said, I don't think by any means that thing is over. I think it's still the technology and all that, and we have to keep, we have to keep hammering into that. But I don't think it's, in, it, it's not any longer an eat of that is self-sufficient. Uh, would you repeat the question very <laughs> short? Just no, just to get. I'm with you. What would be the role of collectivity in pieces today? Fisai. Fisai. Experiments. So Absolutely. Experiments? Well, would, yeah. would it be to uh, uh, promote this speciation? You know, uh, a group who's interested in a particular problem and feed off each other and advance. Well, I definitely. I like the, I like front? the model of the Bohemian Denim. I like the club in in New York. I don't like. I don't like Brock and Picasso. In other words, I, I think when one idea starts to drive those Brock and Picasso, I mean, it was only two of them, so it's not so bad. But when you get together and you drink in your club and you're fighting about stuff like- Juan Gris. Yeah, Juan Gris, okay. Um, you know, so I think it's a really important idea and that the ecological model gives us a way to, like if every cell in your body tried to make you as healthy as possible, you would die called the bureaucratic necessity, meaning a collectivity produces more intelligence when its sub-elements are, are mediocre than when they are all at their, so I think there's something really important about thinking about the question, uh, and that is how do you allow conversations of passions to emerge without subordinating everybody into a collectivity? There are two things that I think are the most horrible experiences of life, being alone and being utterly annihilated by a collectivity. Those are the two horrors. And so I think uh, you have to find a way to mobilize organic groups, allow them to emerge and dissolve de depending on their economics and the flow systems. And then they behave. You know, so I don't want to see, I don't really like what happened at the World Trade Center with the top architects, top friends of mine, found exactly like Ellen had described yesterday, the least common denominator solution. Yeah. Because they didn't know no, how no, to work together. Over. Because you cannot make yourself work together in that way. You can each do a World Trade Center project and meet every night, to talk about it and, and drink about it. And then over time, that will produce a collectivity. Um, first of all, uh, lots of interesting things to say there, not enough time to address it all, but I think another thing that should be put on the table, we don't need to fully control these processes and relationships. One of the great changes that has taken place in our recent life, in the lifetime of everyone in this room, is the degree to which knowledge has actually become, and the circulate has become social. Uh, even the disappearance of the manual associated with a computer because, in fact, you learn how to use the computer because you learn it from friends. You learn all the techniques. You learn it from various networked sort of interrelationships. Um, Architecture is the same way. It's profoundly so. Profoundly so. Uh, the social... By the way, I do not think... I, I was not advocating the ecological approach to absolutely everything, absolutely not. I was simply talking about one area of, of, of interest uh, uh, to our field. But I do think that the social, that, that ultimately that's what ecology really meant for me, was a social system. Um, we need to acknowledge that in our, uh, in our academies. We need to acknowledge the fact that knowledge is not circulating. We need to acknowledge, yes, that knowledge is not circulating, it is not being produced, and it is not being uh, concretized at all in the same ways anymore. Um, and in that sense, we need to listen. You need to listen, actually, more and more. You listen today for the first time. Where are we now, near the end of semester? Um, <laughs> it's... Uh, I listened today because I was forced to against my will. I listened to you <laughs> listening to me, I always and I to learned. Me. I learned. Because I can't it. listen to myself. One, one thing before we're done, I want to thank Elena for putting this together. Uh, already, I mean, she... I've offered to leave my wife hit, in the marriage. I mean, language. she, she took over <laughs> thesis this semester, and she's already doing a phenomenal job. So I just want to thank her.
for all the work that she's doing. Thank you.